Okay, um, so do you, you all know Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? I'm hoping, kind of, roughly. Yes. Okay, um, <clears throat> so I'm calling this the researcher's edition because if you know about the book, um, he submits this giant entry for Earth, and it gets cut down to two words, mostly harmless. And um, unfortunately, I can't make it that short, so this is, you get the long version. Um, so <laughs> some prologue before we get started. Um, this is me, at least without my contact or with my contacts. Um, I'm at Brian Cardell on Twitter, and uh, I'm going to tell you a lot of stuff about standards. And I'm going to tell you from my perspective, so I'm not going to like introduce myself a whole lot because you'll learn about me. Um, but we can start with that. All of these things are things we're going to touch on, and I'll give a shout out to the jQuery Foundation. Um, uh, the jQuery Foundation, if you don't know, is a big foundation and it encompasses lots of projects. Uh, here is an incomplete list, just some that you might know. And it involves standards work, which explains why I'm here talking about standards. Um, and uh, I want to tell you that I love standards and I think that they're terrible, or at least historically they're terrible. Talk about that. Um, but uh, it's not all depressing. There's a happy ending because uh, most of the changes that need to happen to make standards better already have occurred. And I think that's a Herculean kind of accomplishment. And that's thanks to people from organizations and developers all over the world and uh, good faith of standards organizations. So I, I'm excited about that and I wanna tell you about it. Um, but then there's this other thing, the next step, there's this role for developers to play. And that's you here in Pittsburgh. Um, I want to say thanks to Code and Supply and Bearded for helping organize that along with the jQuery Foundation. Um, so about maybe the last third of my talk will be about that. Okay, so let's kind of dive in. So when we talk about standards with regard to the web, these are really kind of the four big standards organizations. Uh, there's ECMA. Uh, where JavaScript is standardized. There's the IETF where like HTTP is standardized, protocols. There's the W3C and the what wig, um, that's the question mark. Um, and things get rather confusing there, but pretty much everything else is there somewhere. Um, so we'll talk about that. Um, so this is me in the mid 90s uh, with regard to standards. Um, <coughs> when uh, the web got started, I was super into it, and I especially liked the part where they paid me a lot of money to make websites. Um, <clears throat> and when the W3C was announced, it was going to be headed by Tim Berners-Lee, the guy who created the web. And it was backed by all these big companies, Microsoft, Netscape, IBM, and it was hosted at MIT, like MIT. This was my vision of the future, right? Uh, Anything that they would have come up with, I would have been like, take my money. Just take, take my money and give me that, right? Um, <clears throat> but I don't, maybe some of you even have that perception of standards. So um, I have this, uh, I've kind of grown what I think about them. And along the way, I had like a lot of misconceptions. So the first one was that somehow they're really special, like they're, it's like this school of Athens, or somehow like they're almost godlike, that they're this group of benevolent beings on top of some mountain that are sitting around thinking of the perfect answers that they'll inscribe into tablets of stone and like tell us how to do it. Um, that's not really how it works. Um, so uh, if you have that idea in your head, that's not right. Um, I used to think that standards had two speeds and one of them was like really ludicrously fast. Um, sometimes it feels like it's really hard to keep up. Um, but I learned over time that that's not standards, that's experiments. Um, part of the reason this is confusing is because um, we have historically done our experiments in the browser. Um, <clears throat> you'll see uh, a long time ago people used to have uh, a link that said like you need to download Internet Explorer, or you need to download Netscape, or maybe there's two links that go to different places. Um, and even like 10 plus years later, um, you had this, which is a different class of thing, but it's confusing because here you have Apple 
uh, saying, hey, download this browser so that you can see all this cool new stuff in HTML5 and CSS3. But nobody else was shipping that, and the, the specs weren't even done. So is that really a standard? It's not, right? Like, it's, it's an experiment. Um, and that got really confusing for developers. And it's unfortunate, but it's part of the original DNA of the web. When Tim created the web, um, he was thinking something really pretty different. Um, he thought that HTML wouldn't be what it is now, that it was kind of like the least understanding bit of the platform, that you could fall back to get text as a you know, last resort. And so if you're thinking that everything is text, then one browser having a little bit more understanding than another is not really a big deal, so you can degrade gracefully. Um, Tim's original proposal and his original browser, it had no forms, no images, no audio, no video, no scripting, no styling, it, it didn't even have colors. Um, and so this became like baked into how we did the web. Um, <clears throat> in reality, the web has only one speed. It's glacial. It is like, oh my god, slow. Uh, I'm going to illustrate with not the worst case scenario. This is just a normal thing. Um, <clears throat> so this is Flexbox. Um, if you have heard that Flexbox is a good thing, like a good story, success story, uh, that's not true. If you've heard that's a horror story, it's not true either. But uh, you see this slide, it gives you the impression that Flexbox took about seven years, which is like, raise your hand if you've ever had a project that you worked on for seven years, right? <laughs> like, th this, is a, this is not a norm, right? Like, people don't typically work on a project for seven years before it's done, right? Like, you might have a project that continues for seven years, but um, <clears throat> to get to phase one, you don't have to wait seven years. But now I'm going to pause while you all weep. Because this isn't actually the whole story. This email is from 2007, and in it, she's talking about a spec that was proposed for the same thing in 2004. Specs don't pop into being, right? You can bet that the true story of Flexbox goes way back before even that. And um, it's just shipping now. Raise your hand if you use Flexbox, like you regularly use it. You know it really well. So like one and a half people. <laughs> Um, it'll take another couple of years before everybody knows that they can use it, and they use it, and they start figuring it out. So you're talking about maybe 15 to 20 years. Uh, that is crazy pants, right? Um, this isn't a typo. Um, <clears throat> getting a standard is really improbable, right? Um, and one of the reasons that it's really improbable is because it involves people. Um, I want to tell you a story. Um, like in a former life, I wanted to be a teacher, and um, I knew a preschool teacher, and he was like great. He get kids so excited about anything, and they would learn so much. And he got this idea in his head that kids would really like whales because they're like these giant sea beasts, right? Like how can you not like whales? So he got this uh, a month he spent putting together information, absorbing everything he could about whales, and he sat the kids down in circle time that morning, and he said, "All right, kids." Today, we're going to learn about whales. And right away, just like that, one of the kids said, my aunt lives in Wales. Um, and immediately, another one said, um, wait, is that a place? Is it far away? Is it across the ocean? Do you have to take a boat? Can you take a plane? My family went to Florida, and we took a plane. And somebody else said, do they talk funny there? Because my, aunt, my mom's friend, Barb, is from Texas, and she talks funny. Um, and when you think about it, all of these things are actually a lot more relevant to those kids' real lives than some giant beast that lives in the ocean, right? And so he had to you know, adjust, and they talked about these things that were you know, really important to these kids, what these kids were really interested in. Um, and that's kind of an analogy for standards. Like You might think that you go there with some idea already fleshed out and perfect in your head, and when you get there, you find out that you're talking about whales instead of whales, right? Um, and that's because we have to get consensus. And um, there's also this concept of bargaining power where um, let's say you join a standards organization um, and you want to get a, a standard passed. Do you make a browser? That's a good question to know because if you do, recall that you can experiment in the browser. And then you can say, yeah, but it's part of a proposal. 
Um, and if you don't make a browser, no matter how badly you want it, you have to convince one of them that they need to do it because they can just not, right? Um, and so you hit stalemates. And then there was this. Uh, when IE6 came out, believe it or not, uh, if you ever had to deal with it, it seems terrible, but at the time, it was like the best browser on the planet. Um, and then they left. They just, like, they, they stay out of the game initially, then they came in and they kicked butt, they gained 95% market share, and then they disbanded the team. Um, so that stinks, but it's not just Microsoft, because like really the whole world gave up on the web. We, like Everybody said, you know, that wasn't really what Tim was thinking. It, it doesn't really work for apps. We think we can do a lot better. We want this like semantic web. We want like an app web. And uh, they decided to reimagine the future. And if you know uh, the mythical man month. I don't know if maybe anybody's read that, but the second system effect is what happened in W3C. Like they had a lot of success and they way overshot and they themselves maybe thought of themselves as a little specially powered uh, when really they weren't. So um, all work stopped on HTML and uh, a group defected and created the what wig and they continued work on uh, HTML, which is great, except that um, Microsoft wasn't involved. So if the guys who control 95% of the market aren't going to budge, how do you get there from here? I don't know who said this earlier, but this is the, the Northeastern expression, right? You can't get here from, there from here. Um, and so uh, maybe a decade into after my, you know, dangling the cherry in front of my face, I guess you could say that my like my attitude towards standards had kind of softened, right? Um, how are we going to get beyond where we were uh, in 1998, 2000? Um, it seemed like it maybe wasn't even possible. Um, but clearly we did, right? Because if you know, we have HTML5 and CSS3 and stuff like that. Like, how do we get there? Um, so the way that we got there is because uh, in 2005, Remy Sharp coined this term polyfill. Um, and a polyfill is essentially a, a, a way for developers to fake it, right? Um, so if you want to use something in HTML5, but your users only have IE6, uh, you can find a way to make those APIs work in IE6. Um, yay, we did it. Um, except that um, HTML5 is also terrible. Um, it also took way too long. Aspects of it are just awful. Um, lots of it failed to come to fruition. Um, and so this is where I'm left at the time. Um, sort of feeling like, what is even going on here, right? Um, it seems so broken, right? Um, but my own frustrations, it turned out, were not unique. Lots of people were unimpressed. Um, and as we started talking, uh, we kind of got together and uh, we got to sort of play the role of Jacob Marley to Web Standards and show them the past, present, and you know, this is, this is the future if you don't uh, correct, you know? Um, and kind of what we were saying at some level is um, we still don't know what we're doing creating web standards. Um, like as a core message, that was uh, not necessarily totally warmly received. Um, it seems a little blasphemous, right? Um, maybe. Uh, I'll take you on a brief aside. Um, if I were to ask you, what time is it right now in New York City? Uh, probably all of you would say, well, Brian, it's 8.02 p.m. in New York, and they're both Eastern Standard Time, so it must be 8.02 in New York City. And you would be, of course, totally correct. Except that 100 years, 150 years ago, you would have been totally wrong. Um, when it was 8.24 in Pittsburgh, over there, it was 11, or when it was 11.24 in Pittsburgh, it was 11.48 in New York. There's a 24-minute difference. Um, 
There were about 10,000 towns in the United States, and all of them had their own official standard time. Um, and that's because there was a time before standards, um, including time itself was not standardized the way that we think about it. Um, as you can imagine, if you have to do things at large scales, like control railroads and make sure that people catch their connections. Yeah, go. Oh. Yeah. Um, That's another standard that people try to work on at one point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Didn't the age come in the early 1900s? I don't know. It's uh, true. You can imagine, though, if you want to run trains and you want people to be able to connect from one train to the next train, and you want to be able to make sure that you have trains using your lines, and that maybe they're not doing this, one going east and one going west on the same track, because I don't know, that might be bad, right? Uh, then kind of agreeing on what time it is is pretty fundamental. You need it. And so trains uh, came along, and they realized we needed this, and they created their own times. So we had Northern Pacific time, which had, uh, you say, hey, there's 14 competing standards. This is crazy. We need to unify them into one, and you wind up with 15, right? That's exactly what happened. It took another 30 years before we have the standard time we know today. And uh, <clears throat> trains were actually one of the things that brought this on. If you look at what happened here, all these things started as discrete experiments. We didn't know we were building a transcontinental railroad. Like, we were experimenting, right? And what people found out pretty quickly as they began to uh, consolidate and they wanted to lease their lines to one another and everything is that, that before standards, this was a train wreck. Um, really simple things that you would take for granted today that you would say, come on, that can't be a thing. Um, like, there were no metallurgical standards. And so as you ran one train's line over another train's lines, um, the rails would break. They would, bridges would collapse. There wasn't a standard width or height for them. So when a foreign train came on your tracks, they would crash into the overpass or get stuck in a tunnel. Um, <clears throat> this is crazy stuff, right? Um, even really basic stuff like cars, you couldn't hitch one thing's cars to another because they had different couplings. But even if you could, it wouldn't matter because they wouldn't fit on the same tracks. Um, they realized that they're agreed on approximately nothing. And as engineers had to face this reality, and they had to deal with it every day, uh, they realized that this is really terrible and really expensive, and they started trying to convince people we need to work together. And so uh, in the early 1800s, this was a, a fringe idea, but people started to do it. Okay, that's the end of my aside. Um, cool story, what's it got to do with what we're talking about? Um, <laughs> what it's got to do with is that there's no standard for standards, right? Standards is really, really young. It's about 100 years that we've even been trying to tackle this problem. And in that time, we got a national standard, and then that wasn't good enough. We got an international standard. What more do you need, right? We have two standards bodies. What more do you need? And yet we have lots of them. The reason that we have lots of them is because the other ones weren't working, <laughs> right? So <clears throat> ISO... Uh, the International Standards Organization, uh, they were geared around physical things. And when it came to uh, software and networking, it was clear that they didn't know what they were doing. They spent more than a decade working on the ISO seven layer model for networking, and it didn't happen. Uh, Vince Cerf and some other guys left. They created the IETF. It works completely differently. We got the internet, right? Um, a couple of decades later, Tim Berners-Lee comes along and he says, hey, Eric, this web thing, um, where would you take it? Well, I'll take it to the IETF. That seemed to work pretty well. So he takes it to the IETF, and you get uh, first the uh, HTTP standard, and that goes over pretty well. And then you're talking about URLs, and well, Tim has to make a lot of compromises to get that through, and including some he's not real happy with. And uh, HTML and CSS, or, or something like CSS, it's a disaster. They, they can't get it done. They spend years trying to get it done, and they can't. So they created W3C, which works, again, completely different. Um, we already talked about how they went down some decade-long excursion into X-everything land trying to reimagine the web, and that's how we got WhatWig. Um, and ECMA, the JavaScript body, when JavaScript needed to be standardized, well, they had a 
bevy of places they could have taken it already, but they didn't. They took it to the European Computer Manufacturers Association, um, who recently decided that they wanted to work on standards, and they thought maybe had a slight anti-Microsoft bent to it. Um, so it's not heretical or blasphemous, and that's the case we had to make, but we're saying we can do better than this, right? Where we're at is not good, and we need to do better. The question is how. So with, given all that background, I want to switch back to Douglas Adams, and he says, this planet has, or rather had, a problem, which was this. Most of the people on it were unhappy for pretty much of the time. Many solutions were suggested to this problem, but most of them involved the movement of small green pieces of paper, which is odd because it wasn't the small green pieces of paper that were unhappy. Um, standards have tried moving all the variables, right? The one thing that they really haven't figured out how to tap into is developers, which is odd because it is the developers who are so unhappy, right? Like, um, so in 2011, uh, Adi Osmani, you may follow, um, uh, wrote this excellent announcement on the jQuery blog announcing the jQuery standards team would be headed up by Yehuda Katz and Paul Irish. And the reason is to give developers a voice in the process so we can try to fix the problems that we're having. Um, so a lot of people came together and discussed a lot of things and uh, got this idea that we needed to reform. We created this extensible web community group to discuss some of those things. Um, and uh, this is, it's hard to explain, but um, this is John Nash uh, in Beautiful Mind. The story in the movie is not really accurate. Um, this scene itself is probably entirely apocryphal, but I like the story, so I'm going to use it anyway. Um, so he's in a bar with his friends, and one of his friends, uh, not one of his friends, all of his friends, say, recall your Adam Smith. If you don't know who Adam Smith is, he's kind of like the father of modern capitalist economics. Recall your Adam Smith who said that the best result comes from when everybody acts in their own self-interest. And John Nash realizes, wait a second, um, I realize that this is what you're teaching us, and this is like we're at Harvard, and this is what you're teaching us, but look at this. In this situation we're in right now, if everybody did what was in their own self-interest, we would all get the worst result. But if we were to act in what's our, in our own self-interest and the larger self-interest, then we get the best result. And um, this is kind of like what we said about standards. Like, there's a lot of good things in standards. Like, it's close, you know? We're not saying it's just absolutely wrong. We're just saying uh, the economics are broken. And here's an example of how economics are broken. Um, recall that we spent a decade spending time on everything XML. I want to put this into actual economic perspective. Uh, we wasted 10 years. Um, tons of developers, like myself, based our lives on that. We sold it to companies. Uh, we got companies to do things. And you could say that probably billions of dollars were spent going down that road. And at the end of the day, developers said, Jason, I choose you. And what happened to all that investment, right? That economics is broken. Um, and the reason is because our priorities are wrong, right? Uh, so for years, uh, standards bodies have said, hey, we have businesses and tech companies and academia, but nobody said, yeah, we have developers, which is crazy because developers are the OP superpower, right? Like, developers are the Hulk. They're the ones you need, right? Um, Douglas Adams on a decade of standards, for a moment, nothing happened, and after a second or so, nothing continued to happen. Um, so I'm citing this because I want to point out a really interesting thing that's critical to this argument. Um, for literally a decade, nothing in terms of the web browser's capability changed. Literally nothing. But if you were on the web at the time, you would know that your experience got so much better. And if you were developing for the web, you would know that your development experience got so much better. And that has nothing to do with standards innovating. And that has everything to do with the fact that we figured out how to deploy the DNA 
right? Um, <clears throat> if we have the DNA available, we'll find a way, right? This thing, like, you, you think I made this up probably, but this is not Photoshop. This is a real thing. This is called a main wolf. It's not a wolf, it's not a fox either. Uh, but it's a canine, and it's what happens when a canine evolves in tall grassland. Um, that thing is crazy looking, right? Like, if, if I asked you to design the perfect fox or the perfect wolf, it wouldn't look anything like that. That thing looks more like a deer, right? Um, but if you give us the DNA, we'll explore the possibilities. When houses were wired for electricity, it was for artificial lighting. That was what we were going to do with it. Um, there weren't appliances. There was nothing else to plug in. There was just lights. There were light bulbs. That's it. And so, but we gave, you gave us new raw materials and we said, hey, I can do stuff with this. So we did stuff with it and we created all these new appliances and everything. And that created a whole new market where now plugs have a role to play. Uh, I think that's pretty good. Uh, that's ugly. It's crazy, but it was a necessary step on the way to get there. Um, so one of the things that we decided was, if you do this, you're going to have a bad time. Um, we can't keep experimenting in the browser because it leads to all these problems, right? Um, so you know what a polyfill is. If you can, if you can fill all the browsers that don't implement something, what if no browser implements something? Uh, instead of you know shipping something in Safari and saying download this, why can Apple not do it in JavaScript and CSS and give you one file you can download that works on all browsers? Hey, I don't know, it seems kind of cool. Like if you've ever used jQuery or jQuery UI or uh, you know, Ember, Angular, like all these things work in all browsers. Like why can we not propose new features that way? That should work, I think. Um, and that would let us tighten up the timelines because um, that example of Flexbox isn't unique. And I'll show you one of the benefits. Um, this thing, the local link pseudo class was first proposed 1998. Somebody do the math. I'm not that good with math, but that's a long time ago, right? 1998. And uh, it has popped in and out of like standards through the years, like it was in CSS2 and then it was in CSS, or sorry, it was in CSS3 and then it was in CSS4 and it taken out and uh, we can't get it. But I remember reading about it somewhere around 2000 and I was like hyped for it. I was like, yes, I need that thing. And then every time it comes out, I go, God, what happened? Why didn't we get that thing? Um, so uh, when we were talking about how a polyfill might be a good idea, I uh, developed a polyfill for CSS that lets you build in a jQuery plugin style a way to support new selectors. So we could test out ideas and you could actually use them. And um, so I did this and I created it and I, want, I wrote tests because I thought, hey, we could do like TDD. Like you could have an implementation. It already has the test. When, if it's accepted, the browsers go to implement it. Tests are already there. Just go for it, right? Um, that seemed like it would be a good thing. But when I did it, I shot the tests over to the editor because I was very proud of it, right? And the editor said, no, that's not what it, those are wrong. Um, and by the time I got it to where they were right, I went, that's not what I thought it was at all. And not just not what I thought it was at all, but I have no need for that thing, right? <laughs> that thing is not worth anything. I don't want it. Um, that would be a lot better to know in 1998, don't you think? Like, if, we were to, if I were to give you this in 2017, after we had spent tons of money on it and then nobody needed it, whose purpose does that serve, right? Um, so another thing that we said is that there is actually other models for standardization that totally work. Um, a dictionary, for example, doesn't have a group of people who sit on Mount Olympus and you know, create the language. Um, we create the language. Um, dictionary editor's job is to find the language that we created. Uh, when they hear something colloquially enough, they go and look and they find all the references and they make sure all these people are talking about the same thing. They write down the definition and it enters the OED. Um, the OED is beautiful and colorful and it contains the entry for the F-bomb. Not the F word, the F-bomb. Like, 
The F-bomb is defined in the OED. Um, which is kind of cool because people drop the F-bomb, right? Like, I mean, we can pretend it doesn't exist, but it does. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the real key here is that um, this thing about dictionaries, it rubs some people the wrong way. Like maybe you're taking away their powers to create or something, um, but you're not because we're saying you can, you can contribute, you can create with polyfills, you can, there's other things that you can do as well. Um, I'm going to tell you another story that uh, lets you know that this is not actually radical at all. Um, some people might know that Tim Berners-Lee didn't invent hypertext. Hypertext was all the way around. Um, in fact, hypermedia, which is kind of what we have with the web today, was already like really popular. Uh, Hypercard on the Mac was making games like Myst when Tim Berners-Lee came along. Um, it just wasn't widely networked, and Tim created this concept of a link and a network and everything. Um, man, I feel like I'm taking too long here. Um, <clears throat> he didn't invent angle braces or tags. Those already existed. There was a, an actual ISO standard, something that had passed the international standards tests called SGML, and it was really popular. In fact, it was so popular that at CERN, where Tim worked, there were volumes of it. There were lots and lots of SGML. And so Tim said, let's look across the SGML and see what occurs a lot. And we'll see that they're all mean the same thing and we'll extract from that just like a dictionary editor does. And so the original 20 tags in HTML minus the link, that's where they came from basically. Um, and actually because we experiment in the browser, um, this is how we got to all the other standards too. Um, we went from on every single one of the occasions of things that are standardized, we went from something that was deployed in a browser that was proprietary, a proposal, and literally the next day without a byte of code changing that was standard. Um, so uh, we think you know we can do better than this. And um, a bunch of people got together in standards and came up with this document, the Extensible Web Manifesto. Can I ask just real quick, like, can you raise your hand if you've heard of this document? Okay, that's depressing to me. Uh, so uh, the Extensible Web Manifesto is a really short document, uh, but it is sort of like a Declaration of Independence level thing more than a Constitution level thing. And what it does is it lays out a vision that is in line with all these things that we talked about. And um, it says that we really need to reimagine our approach to web standards and we need to involve developers um, and tighten the feedback loop because um, you can't wait for 15 years to get your hands on something. Like, you have to ship code, right? Like, um, what's the reason you want to learn a web standard so you feel smart? No, it's because you have a job to get done, right? Like, that's broken. We can't do that. We have to tighten that. We have to compress that somehow. We need to get ideas out there sooner, be able to evaluate them sooner, and be able to take feedback sooner. Um, so we ask that you prior that standards bodies prioritize their work on primitives, uh, low-level things. We want them to give us socket, they, you know, uh, an electrical socket, and we'll do lots from there, right? Um, we'll imagine the higher levels, and not just give us new ones, uh, but look in the platform because there's lots in there already that isn't exposed. There's lots of magic in the platform. CSS is entirely magic. How does it work? We don't know. Um, there's this thing in CSS that does layout and it's called the box tree, right? Like the box tree is the thing. Um, do you know that Internet Explorer all the way up until 11, no box tree? Um, because like it, it could only be observed like spooky action at a distance. Like you could still pass all the tests without actually having a box tree. Um, so that's messed up. Let's not do that. Um, and we want to like rather than ship things with browsers, where possible we want to give people something that works in all browsers. So, you know, not just here's a bunch of text that you might misunderstand, you probably won't read, it's not really of any value. Like, here's the thing. What can you do with it? Does it work? Does it suck? We need to know. Uh, and that we need to incubate these ideas. Like, we need to find a better way to do that. And that standards works work better like dictionaries than they do like startups. Um, 
So this idea is totally winning, and that's totally exciting. Um, this is the guiding principle today at ECMA, W3C, and WhatWig. Uh, and they're changing policies to accommodate this. One is that there is an incubator community group that is totally public where new ideas are proposed, whether they're from me or Matt or Justin or um, the Chrome team. Uh, ideas go there, and we can look at what ideas are pitched, and we can try and use them where possible. And we can weigh them in the balance. This is one of my paintings. Um, <clears throat> okay, but there's still a problem because the way that standards work is through communication. And communication is really, really hard. Um, the way that it works historically is that we'll get on a plane and go fly somewhere and talk to people a few times a year. Or we'll all join a mailing list. Um, so I want to tell you Meetup uh, has 4 million people who call themselves web developers. That's not all of the web developers. That's just the ones who are motivated enough and know enough about Meetup and are motivated enough to come out and come to at least one talk. Right? They sign up for Meetup. Joining a mailing list is a much lower bar than that. So you can imagine that we would have more than 4 million people on the mailing list uh, shouting at one another. And uh, I imagine we would get nowhere quickly. Um, so it's the alternative idea. 4 million of us get on a plane and go where? Right? Uh, what venue could accommodate four million people, and how could you possibly organize it to uh, achieve anything useful? You couldn't. So that's where you guys come in. Not you guys. Yins. <laughs> um, uh, so the idea is chapters, and chapters is a way to decentralize this. So rather than just say, hey, you know, whenever you want, you can go look at this community thing and, you know, then what? You send feedback on a forum. I don't know. Like it's still not great. Um, so chapters is a way we can get together, right? We can people in local places can come and uh, and here's why this idea is going to win because like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, we have don't panic and we're slightly cheaper. Um, <coughs> so <coughs> by this I mean asking questions in a forum for standards today is like kind of scary, right? Like. It's easy to feel like you're going to be judged. You feel like those people must be on a completely different plane than you. Um, you don't want to feel like there's a possibility you might get ridiculed by the people who created the language or something, right? Um, but in this room, like, we can talk, right? Um, like, I don't know all your names, but I'd like to. Uh, we could. Uh, Asking questions in a group like this is actually really easy. And this is a lot like the build night uh, that they do. We want to get together and we want to uh, fix the economics in a way that's like, these are the proposals. What are you interested in? And we can look at them. We can talk to them. You can try, you can try them out. You can take them to work and maybe get real work done, which wouldn't that be phenomenal, right? Like you could take something and use it for selfish purposes to try and get something done. And then if that turns out to not be so good or if it turns out to be fantastic or you think you know how to make it better, you can. Um, so that's the idea. There's like a few examples of things that are in the incubator community group right now. And I feel like I'm running long. So I had some kind of more in-depth examples to show you. But um, these are all things that are very hard to do today to get right uh, that you might not even think about. Um, but they're very, very, very hard, like paradoxically hard problems from an accessibility standpoint. And these are three proposals that make those things easy. Um, so I, I'm totally happy to show anybody those afterward or any other one. But um, that's the idea, chapters. And so what I want you to do is uh, don't be silent, have your voice be heard, come to chapters, join the rebellion, help us extend the web forward. Questions, comments, anybody want to? If you take questions, repeat them for the last Sure. Time. There are people watching. So. Okay, cool. Yeah? Is there a local standards group? Yes, we're going to be announcing one. You watch. It is uh, Code and Supply will be organizing it with Bearded Studios and the jQuery Foundation. And so the idea is that we can have lots of deep discussion and uh, we can ask 
silly questions or you know whatever, uh, and then that will be summarized. You know, as we learn a little bit, we'll write a kind of summary and we'll shove that back out into web standards in a manageable way. So we make it possible to hear four million voices. Right? Anything else, sir? I don't do web development. I'm a database administrator. I, I do Perl scripting, Dash scripting, and so on. So one of the things that I feel is an obstacle of I just want to go out and build a website is what framework, what infrastructure do you use, and how do you pick one? And it seems like that's changed dramatically over the last few years. A lot of it is like what it used to be back in the day was typing HTML into strings and trying to concatenate everything together and make a screen that looked like something. Mm -hmm. Still a lot of things are that. Um, yeah. So if you use something that happens on the server side, um, uh, it is effectively crunching together strings because HTML is a serialization, right? It's just text, um, which is one of the things that makes it powerful. But then it gets parsed out and created into the document object model. And the document object model has like events and can be scripted. And um, so there's kind of more modern things that run in the browser that are uh, single page sort of applications, right? That um, uh, you send across a serialization and what to do with it, and that all happens in the browser without reloading a whole page. So both exist at the same time, and now uh, there are things uh, like Ember, for example, uh, has, uh, I think it's called fast boot, um, where they can run on both sides. They can take it and send you the initial thing uh, as HTML, or uh, they can operate through uh, the DOM and do scripting in a single page. Uh, the really cool thing about the other sort of single page thing is there's a whole bunch of new technologies that um, like open their, their socket level things, right? They open up new doors for how we think about that and they're web oriented so those things, those states have URLs. You can send somebody a link to the exact thing that you're looking at just like you always could with um, with just you know a, a string based thing that you would send back. But um, there's no right answer. Um, there's any number of easy things depending on what you prefer. Um, so what you're comfortable with you can find any number of like good answers and I'm sure that other people would totally help you with that. Like, sure. Any other? Hit me. So, have the opportunity to connect the limbs um, to like what happens when standards bodies like still like fully related, unrelated to tech. Um, and what I'm sort of seeing is that a lot of times there are like two main reasons for a standard organization to exist. Either it's like a common good kind of thing, mm -hmm. or it's about like a like a defensive play for an organization or a company to. Mm, that's a good business. point. Yeah. So this seems to be like a movement oriented around the common good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how you mentioned the Google Chrome theme, for example. Yeah. How how do you anticipate handling interactions with special interests? Yeah. So <clears throat> um, let me see if I can summarize that for the microphone. Um, effectively. The question, and correct me if I misstate it, the question is that um, like, the reasons for participating in standards are complex, right? Some aspects of it are sort of for the greater good and others are like defensive sorts of things so that other people can't run away with a patent or come back and sue you or whatever. That is actually one of the, believe it or not, one of the most important things in standards. Um, and the question was, uh, this chapter's uh, seems like it's uh, really more communally oriented and how do we prevent, uh, how do we entice, I suppose, other people to participate and not block us? Is that the idea? Just how do you anticipate handling special interests like companies that own the web browser? How do you anticipate han handling s companies that like own a web browser? That's the question, right? Okay, so all of these companies are members of W3C. Most of them are members of the w, what WG, and all of them are members of ECMA, and it's done. Uh, it, it's already done, so that's 
what I was saying, like this is Herculean level stuff. Um, when you go to the, um, when you go to, oh, that button doesn't go anywhere. Well, let's just go there. I think we can actually go there. Uh, that is not the right browser. When we go to the what way, this is actually part of W3C, it's a community group. And um, when you go to participate on here, um, you uh, effectively uh, have a, a like license, you know, that you're going to participate in the standard. Um, so does that answer your question? Like, they are participating. Um, it is part of the way standards work now. Um, I don't foresee anybody blocking that. Um, it was one of the big concerns with this, and we appear to be past it. Um, the lawyers are all seem more or less pretty happy. And um, did I answer your question? Because you don't look convinced. I'm kind of interested in like, the influence aspect of this. Like, so I'm Apple, right? And right. I, I own the Safari web browser. Okay. And I think that this thing that I'm going to build is so hot that I want to get it. That you want to ship it. You want to ship it anyway. Yeah, I want to get it a new standard. Yeah. And so how do, you, how do you handle that? How do you have checks and balances? After that? Yeah. So um, clearly there will be a need for new sockets, right? There are new things that we cannot possibly um, fake, right? Um, if you wanted to do, like, for example, push notifications, where, you know, you get a notification that pops up in the upper right hand of your screen or on your phone that says, Hey, this person sent you this thing, and here's a link. You can go check it out. Um, there's no way to fake that, right? Like, that's a low-level capability. So we do need browsers to do that kind of thing. And um, they know that game, and they know that it works together, that, that they have to work together. The thing that we did that improves that is that none of them will ship those things unprefixed into the wild until we're further along in the process. So... Um, the norm now for new things uh, is to ship them behind a flag. So if you uh, go into your Chrome or your Firefox and you go to the settings, there's flags that you can set that says, I want to enable this experiment. And you can do it and you can try it. But of course, the utility of that is somewhat limited because you, you can't ship a product like that or you would be ill-advised to ship a product like that. It, it's very clear to you then that it's an experiment. Um, there is still the potential that somebody can block something, a low-level thing. Um, that happened with web components. Do you know web components? Web components are going to change in the universe, guys. Um, guys, twice I said guys. I'm trying to work on that. Um, <coughs> uh, there's this thing called the Shadow DOM. Do you know what the Shadow DOM is? OK. Um, <coughs> so. If you were to look at the video player, for example, the video, there's a new element called, not new, but it's an element called video. And um, you know how that thing is implemented in the browser? It's, it basically already is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But there's this kind of protective bubble around it. And what they did is expose that and call it the shadow DOM. But not everybody had exactly the same thing. And how we exposed that is, was like questionable. We didn't really know how. And um, some browsers like uh, Mozilla and uh, Chrome really, really, really want to ship this thing, right? Like, we really, really want to get this thing out the door. And Apple said, we're not ready to commit to that. Um, it turned out to be a good thing because what Apple came up with was actually much better than what we had on the table at the time. The compromise that they made and everything it was actually better. And part of the way that it got better is because... We did have people like trying to fake it and doing experiments behind flags and everything. And we discovered that we can do better than that. Um, so, you know, there's still challenges. If you, but if there are people, there are challenges, right? Like that, that's the way it's humanity. But I think that this is much, much, much better. I think this is really exciting stuff. Questions from the internet. Hold on. I switched uh -oh. tabs. Heather, um, you presented on that 
speeches yep. this week and is presenting that abstractions. Okay. Wants to know how will the standard bodies standards bodies weight weight and recognize chapters? In other words, will they be taken seriously? Okay. So the question from the internet was uh, how will standards bodies uh, treat feedback from uh, from chapters? Will we be taken seriously? Um, <clears throat> so one of the aims of chapters is to pair chapters with people who have some connection back to standards. So for example, here, uh, we started this up and I'm here and I represent uh, jQuery to standards bodies in, w in W3C. So I can take that feedback and I can take it back to jQuery and jQuery becomes our bargainer, right? But um, jQuery is, the jQuery Foundation is organizing this, but like we have people from other companies. For example, in Portland, uh, somebody from Google wants to set up a, a thing in Portland. So uh, I think it will be taken seriously. And in fact, uh, this WICG.io, uh, this has only been up for maybe a year and a half. And I don't think a lot of people know about it yet, really. But um, there are ideas that have come from the community um, that have uh, already like entered standards. So I, yeah, I think, I think that they'll take us seriously. And the other piece of that is that uh, these standards bodies already know that they have this gap because we've been you know, selling them this thing with the extensible web manifesto and uh, for a long time. Uh, so they recognize that this is a big gap. In fact, they're doing a lot more outreach now um, W3C has this thing called the Technical Architecture Group, and they're a uh, kind of steering committee for where the work goes. Um, and uh, they're chaired by Tim Berners-Lee, the creator of the web. Um, and they now actually, every time they have a face-to-face -face meeting, they have it in different places all the time, they actually have a meetup just like this where you can come and ask your questions and say, hey, freaking deal with this thing, right? Um, and, you know, uh, they know that they have a, a gap and they're, they're doing things to, uh, to help close it. Yes? Uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is, from the time that the Mozilla team and the Chrome team were ready to ship video to the time that Safari got up, how long did that take? Well, what is the right case? Because you said there's really slow and right. So the question is, from the time that Safari and Mozilla shipped video, how long did it take for other people? From right. the time Chrome and Mozilla were ready to ship it. Chrome so and Mozilla. To get the input additional and get consensus from Apple, how much longer does it take? It was a good So what is the right case? Um, about Safari catching up. It was about Safari catching up with Chrome the anecdote you made a few minutes ago. Was that about web components or video? That was web components, yeah. yeah. So here's your thing about So the, the question is, um, what is the right pace, effectively? Right. Yeah. And uh, how, like, how long was the gap once we decided that we needed a video element and we had a implementation of it? Like, how long is the appropriate time, right? Right. Okay, so, well, with a polyfill, one answer is who cares, right? Um, if you could make video as an element work, everywhere. Um, first of all, there's new opportunities there. Like we can create new ways to cache so that really you only have to download that ever from one site. Um, and then you have support for that tag. Um, and there are efforts around that. They're like, so that's kind of cool. But so if you could download the proposal and everybody gets the proposal, you don't have to wait for them to implement. As far as like when it becomes native, because it is nice that we eventually get things that are native. How long should it take? Uh, the answer is, I don't know. Um, but I'll tell you something that's almost even worse because everybody ships video now, right? I mean, that's great, except that like Firefox, you couldn't use a lot of stuff because they support different codecs. Um, that sucked. Um, much more than that, uh, Chrome is the only one. Uh, there's somebody just recently made a post about this where it's a, like they are fixing this in one browser, I don't know which, but at least up until say a month ago, uh, 
The only video player that was accessible was Chrome. <laughs> So y'all were using uh, some old Flash thing, and if you had one that was accessible, uh, in some ways that was better than the one we're using now. Not in all ways. I mean, I actually much prefer that we have. But you know, you want to have an accessible video player. You want somebody to be able to use it. Like I talked about this last time um, in the last meetup. I asked a question, uh, offered some feedback, but there are times when everybody is disabled, right? If you break your arm or if you sprain your arm, you're, you have a, like, it's difficult for you to operate a mouse, right? And you can use your keyboard and you can tab through things. You can use enter and type and um, there are other things that you can do uh, to use something. And if you can't use them because they're not accessible, that impacts you, right? So. Um, like, I think it's like 15% of people in the world have some kind of disability. Um, that's a lot of people to cut out, you know. You, ultimately, we want things that are accessible, and not having an accessible video player as our native video player is, in my mind, kind of bad. Uh, I kind of would have rather had a universal polyfill until we decided that in order to ship, it needs to be accessible, and everybody ships at their own pace. But Oh. So is the improvement that all the browser manufacturers are on board, or yeah, all do the... we need another standards for? Um, well, it's not an in... incremental. Yeah, browser. I don't know that it's another standards organization. I mean, this is like I showed. Like this is actually the uh, express fundamental principles of ECMA, um, Wetwig, and W three C. Like the People involved in that, like, it has a lot of support in, in those. Um, it's it's winning as an idea, um, so it's reforming those things as much as it is creating something else. The only thing that it's creating additionally is new outlets within that. So um, this WICG.io is actually a W3C effort, right? But this is. You know, it's trying to shift the way things work uh, to try to involve, you know, a new approach. Does that make sense? So, uh, what you're proposing is just chapters, which is the community. Yeah. So here, the only thing that's really a proposal at this point is chapters. Um, so what we want to do is distribute it. We want to get people from around. You know, around the world to start up. There are plenty of meetups. There are lots of meetups where people go and do things like build nights, and they talk about you know how how do you do this? Can you teach me this? And you want things that are relevant to your life. And the point is that there are lots of proposals that are actually quite relevant to your life, right? That you would to be totally interested in learning about and maybe using. So you know, why not involve that into our meetup process so that uh, we use that as a means of both education and communication both ways uh, that that's does that answer or no yeah um, just one last one sorry. yeah um, so how how are chapters different than just you know, just, you know they so they're oriented they're or yeah really um, so like there's a lot that isn't defined yet like for example, I don't know if maybe there's opportunity for us to do like some like special build nights to cooperate build nights where that's what we're going to focus on. You know what I mean? Um, so does that make sense? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So uh, if you have thoughts or ideas, let's talk. Matt, you look like you want to ask a question. I, I, Make a statement. I want to add something. Yeah. Add. Is that okay. Is maybe the dumbest guy in the room? Could I add something? Because <laughs> there are two, there are a couple of things. Like I heard a few things in some of the questions that took me a while to understand as a person whose knowledge shops basically HTML, CSS, and a designer. So some of these things took me a while to get. Um, one is that if a lot of you haven't read the accessibility manifesto, the general concept when they talk about high and low level, um, uh, like fundamental primitives. Yes, but, right. Yeah. So when he talks about like low-level and high-level features, what they're talking about is 
getting standards in their glacial pace to focus on these low-level features, which would be opening up the possibility of exploiting what is currently locked into the browser into regular developers. So the fact that you can build your own high-level features, which would be small things, right? Like features we think of as features that we wait for the W3C to come up with. Now we can do that ourselves by opening up these APIs in systems that we currently do not have access to. So like web components allow you to build your own custom HTML. You could have built the video element yourself and just had it work, which would be amazing and not wait for Sam to do it. And then when enough people do it a certain way through polyfills and polyfills, that syntax can be grabbed onto by Sam so you can codify it and make it part of the system. Right? And that's really the thrust of the accessible web manifesto. They use our syntax and our grammar to create things that are proven to be what we wanted in the first place instead of saying, Here's what you want, and then we go, shit, this is what we wanted at all, we waited 20 years for it. It's like that metaphor you used before about the uh, census of the dictionary. Exactly. It's exactly yes. so we just, exactly. We know the slang we want to, it's right. not there for us to use, but if enough people do use it, like it, then it must be good, and they need to use it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think um, that concept, like a very good example of that concept, and actually really like rank for me, did, how many of you follow the response of the images community group that like hot drama on the internet? You know, the picture the, element? Do you know about the picture element? Yeah, picture and, and picture fill and all that stuff. So, the, the gen, do so you want to, to tell that story? Well, to set it up, the, uh, there's new challenges that come about. Um, the web was totally unprepared for um, like uh, all these different size screens and um, retina uh, displays, these high def displays and everything. And um, the image tag was actually kind of forced in by Mark Andreessen, uh, he just slid it in as an experiment and said, that's what we're going to do, and then everybody had to copy it. Um, <coughs> um, oh, sorry. Uh, that's something else. Uh, so how would you do things like deal with the fact that some people might have a slower connection, for example. They might have like different resolution. They, there's all different kinds of things that might impact what actual image you want on there. The web had no way to accommodate that. And um, web developers began a community group. Uh, community groups are things you can create in the W3C. You have to get reach a critical mass of, it's small, it's like five people, and one of them has to be a sponsor from W3C. Um, but you can create a community group and then you can use W3C resources to organize and talk about things. Um, and the goal of most of them is to go somewhere, right? Um, <clears throat> so the Responsive Image Community Group tried to do this, and they worked with standards, and they worked with the Wetwig, who kind of told them to go fly a kite. Uh, they worked with W3C, who was like, eh, we don't really know. Like, there's a, a really long story there that could be, it is talks of its own. Um, but they actually created uh, the picture element, and they created the picture fill. And the picture fill was used on like actual percentages of the top million sites. So is it a good idea? I think you can safely say it was a good idea. And so now that's going to be part of the standard. I think somebody might know who supports it. We can look it up on Can I Use if you want. But I'm, I'm pretty sure it's actually natively supported in at least two browsers right now. Um, but that path was a very bumpy. Impression. Yeah, that path was very, very bumpy. And so a lot of those people, in fact, the uh, WICG is uh, actually headed up by mostly people from the Responsive Images Community Group. Um, the uh, Responsive Images Community Group and the Extensive Web Community Group had really a lot of overlap and worked on really a lot of things. A lot of people kind of crossing both those. Um, do you know Smashing Magazine? Uh, I don't know. It has like, I don't know, 24 million readers or something crazy like that. Um, but do you know it? There, um, <clears throat> Houdini is maybe the most exciting development in CSS that you never heard of. Um, Houdini is a task force that its whole entire job is to explain what's underneath CSS and expose the same parts to developers. We know that there's a CSS parser, right? So you use SAS or you use less, or you use post-CSS, uh, or you use my thing, like, um, we all have to parse CSS, and actually it's really, really hard. 
And all of those other parsers actually fail, like just around the edges. Like SAS is really, really good, but I think it's not 100% either. Um, wouldn't it be great if there was like a parser we could expose? Because the browser has one, right? Like, why should we write that again? Like, the, part, the browser already knows how to parse CSS, right? Uh, and the reason is because it's just hidden down there. Um, the browser already has this thing called paint. Like, it just how you blip the stuff on the screen. And that ties into the rendering process. Wouldn't it be great if we could say, like, here's how you have a custom painter. You just plug in your own custom painter, and you can uh, imagine new possibilities with CSS. I don't know if you've ever seen GSS, but GSS is really interesting. Um, it's kind of what CSS might have been if we come up with it today. It's constraint-based styles. Um, but it exists, but like you have to kind of reinvent the universe before you can even do any of it. And so uh, the Houdini task force is exposing all those low-level things. You can look this up. If I'll, maybe I'll share a link to it. But there's, uh, if you prefer presentations, there's three or four presentations on this now. Um, this is the direction that Matt is talking about. Um, we don't want uh, to spend a lot of time on these really high-level things like app cache that contain lots of new magic, right? We want to expose the magic we already have and worry about where there's new magic necessary because there will be like push notifications, um, we want to just keep that small so that we can find out when developers start plugging into it, what do they build? You know, do they build toasters and refrigerators or do they build something else? Yeah. One of the reasons I brought up responsive images was because of the exact situation we were concerned about with Apple overriding people's wishes mm -hmm. um, happened with responsive images. Yeah. So, um, the picture element was was coined by was would it have been guys at film right? It was like Scott Jones yeah, and right. Matt Markey and um film group that worked mm -hmm. on the Boston Globe, right? Like the first many years Um so they suggested responsive images, um, they were told to start a community group, things got really convoluted and frustrating for everyone on all of those sides. And then Apple from their perspective seemingly came out of the blue and said, Oh hey guys, we want to do it this way. Um, and that was that was a picture that was what was the other one? Like the source source set, yeah. So they were like, "Hey, we want to do this way." It's called source set, and basically, well, was it Apple that did that, or was it? I'm pretty sure that I could be wrong. Yeah, I could be wrong too. I wish we had somebody from the RACG here, but from what I what I what I heard from responsive images was that they proposed that and immediately stand was like, "Great." Yeah, I thought it was actually Hixie. Was that what it was? So if you don't know, but that was that direct line into standards. Yeah. Was yeah. concerning, and then people were upset, and everyone there was like a big fight. And <laughs> it went on for a really long time, and then finally it ended up good. And there was a good compromise, and like everyone's happy with the way it turned out. But that path was really difficult, and I feel like chapters is a way to circumvent that whole problem of like regular developers clashing and going through way too much. I, I talked to Matt Murphy at length about his experience with running that system, and he was like, he just sounded exhausted from all. Yeah, like he never wants to do it again. Yeah, a lot of people who were involved with that uh, wrote articles and gave talks later about what uh, horror that was. And that, Those articles and things actually were part of the thing that helped us finally get to where we have the WICG. Um, I just wanted to mention this because it's relevant to your thing. So recall that their W3C was this group of people that they had to work by consensus and the what way like, dropped off and began their own thing. And I told you that all of these things, they all work differently, right? They all have subtle differences in how they try to attack the problem, right? So Wetwig has, let's call it a benevolent dictator model, um, where yes, there's all this discussion, but ultimately it's like pretty much one guy who decides. And his name is Ian Hickson, or was, not, not so much anymore. But, um, and so when you would have a problem, you would take it and there would be lots of discussion. But sometimes, Hixie is what he's called. Um, sometimes Hixie would just like write stuff down <laughs> and be like, there it is, it's the standard, right? And it sort of didn't matter what everybody else said. Um, so uh, there's challenges with like all of these models. So like, you, you know, you were asking earlier, 
like how do you plan to solve all the problems? Well, I don't know if we'll solve all the problems, but I feel like we'll do much better because the economics are right. Uh, we don't have these glacial time scales. We already have won the important battles, like all of the the browsers and the standards bodies are very supportive of this and uh, yeah. I, I can tell you one more thing. Stop yeah, go. That's something that Brian will probably never tell you um, because, like, he's himself. Um, but um, I made plenty of money about when this should be done, like, real soon, like, hours and days. Um, but part of how I was able to make the movie as me is because I met Brian, um, who just happens to be the brother in law of one of my partners with Bearded, and I had no idea about this. But we started talking. And Brian was able to connect me with some of the best interviews in the movie. He got me um, Chris Wilson, who worked on uh, the Windows version of Mosaic, which was a commercial web browser. He worked on Internet Explorer all the way through whatever, six or something, and now he's with Chrome. Um, he got me in touch with Tom Zachelik, who wrote some of the um, CSS specs that he used all the time. He worked on i5 for Mac, um, and now he's at Mozilla, works on Firefox. He's a really smart guy. He's written specs for a lot of things you use daily. Um, he got in touch with Alex Russell, who uh, created Dojo, and Web Components, and now he's on the Chrome team, another brilliant guy. And uh, and in, in fact, with, with Tim Berners-Lee, who created the web. So Brian is connected to all of these people. He got in touch with all of them that were totally out of my sphere of access. Um, and they, they all respect him incredibly, and they listen to him. The fact that we have him here in Pittsburgh, and he's a nice guy, and we have this access. If, if we work with him on stuff and suggest things, um, he can definitely connect to the standards. So having Brian as a resource that can like shepherd things into the standards world that you don't have to worry about it, we can just tell him what, what we want and what works for us and what makes sense to us um, is incredible. So um, yeah, I hope you all take advantage of that. Thanks, Brian. Sure. That was beautiful. <laughs> I, I think it's amazing that he's here in Pittsburgh and he's willing to help. I mean, it's super cool. I it's think it's like very different than yeah, I'm from the mountain. I very much agree, and I think that we're super excited. Um, I want to I have a formal end, but I'm not kicking anyone out just to like have that break because um, it sounded like there was a, that was just like perfect uh, thing to break in on. Um, but what's next? Where, where are we going to go, Brian? We're gonna we're gonna announce. We're gonna, uh, we have to work on what? when, but it will be on Code and Supply. We'll help organize it, and we're gonna start a meetup. Maybe I don't know. Maybe the first one might be good to do as a build night thing. Yeah. We can maybe circle some more people. But is there a chapters mailing list? Join the revolution. Oh yeah. So there is actually a Slack channel, and we'll uh, get you connected with that through the the so, event page. So pay attention to chapters IO. Uh, Food and Supply Twitter will be putting out uh, information there and we'll, we'll put information on our mailing list too to yeah. put people over to the chapter stuff and this thing relies on at least like four or five of you being super in, involved and like like really like yeah, we wanting, need, like wanting we really to change need things so, so the revolution the needs you right? Isn't Pittsburgh the first chapter? Uh, so Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh will be the first uh yeah, let's call it official one. So there was a pilot in Vermont, uh, which was you know a small rural uh, thing. Uh, I did that, and then uh, some things happened in my personal life that forced me to move back to Pittsburgh. Don't say uh, forced. Well, you you understand what I'm saying? Like it, my if, my it life real changed. To move to oh yeah, to okay. <laughs> that encouraged me warmly. All good things that lured me, lured me to Pittsburgh. Right. Yeah, I was in Vermont, and I uh, and I came to Pittsburgh, and we kind of shut that one down. Uh, that was just a pilot. We called it a pilot. We could figure out kind of how it worked and if it would work. And um, some other people around the world were uh, interested in maybe starting one up, but they needed connection to get it going. And so the jQuery Foundation is now behind that, and we are connecting people as uh, they want to be connected to start them up. So, yes. Uh, Pittsburgh is 
But I think people are really paying attention to what happens here too. Like right after I first announced it a few months ago, do you guys know Dave Hooper? Um, he's a developer for uh, Paravel and Austin. He, he did Fitbits, which you may have used to make response videos. He's just a real funny guy. Um, he immediately tweeted at me and was like, hey, is that is that real? Like, are you guys actually doing that? Because I'm really interested in doing an Austin. So I think a lot of people are going to respond that way. It could be something interesting. Isn't he involved in Shop Talk? Yeah, he's, he and Chris Coyier on Shop Talk, you know, Chris Coyier from CSS Tricks. Maybe you ever need to know how to do a CSS thing and didn't, and then you knew. For me Sorry, that was more like a prompt for you to say than a question. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, but, I mean, maybe you know that. Yeah. But, yeah, and Dave also, he's one of the uh, A11Y uh, project yeah. people, which you may I just realized that the mic is probably still on, and if he was listening, I don't want him to think I didn't know. <laughs> that guy, yeah, it's like shop talk. You know, I, shop talk. <laughs> I do. Um, anyway, yeah. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll end this so that you can't offend 